All right, good morning. Okay, welcome to those of you that are here in Phoenix. We are very, very glad you're here. If you are new, uh, welcome. We're glad you're joining us also. Um, before we get started, if you want to know more about our ministry, go online to womensbiblestudy.com. Uh, you can get handouts for today's lesson. There's a lot of stuff in today's lessons that actually will be in your handout that won't be on the screen, so it's kind of a long, involved story today. Um, but we, you can watch us lots of different ways. Uh, we have apps for your phone, um, YouTube, Roku channel, podcasting, lots of different places. But everything you need to know about is on our womensbiblestudy.com um, website. So, all right, before we start, I want to introduce you to two really special girls. Come on up, girls. Um, you're going to love this. I get, a, I get an email a couple months ago from Miss Hannah. So this is Hannah. You have to come this way so you get in front of the camera. <laughs> Hannah and Meredith. Okay, so everyone needs to be really nice to Hannah and Meredith today. Okay. <laughs> the reason why is because these adorable little girls, they, um, they decided that um, they're from Ohio. And so she emailed me a couple months ago and she said, we're thinking of coming out to your Bible study. Well, when people tell me that, that just means... My family's having a reunion in Phoenix, and we're going to show up. So she called me last week. Hannah called me, and she said, hey, we're going to be there next week. And I said, well, are you visiting family? And she says, no, we're literally flying in just to watch Bible study today. I know. Isn't that so impressive? And they're so young. It's so cute. So I asked Hannah, I said, how in the world did you even find our Bible study? Um, and she said her mom, when she was a sophomore in high school, her mom has been watching us for the last, like, six years. And so that's, she watches, and then she got her sister-in-law to watch, and then all of this is going on. And they had the cutest baby over here. He's like so cute. He's eight months old. And so I told her when, he, when the baby gets here, I said, um, I said, Lucas, right? I said, we'll just put Luke. The minute I start talking, I just put people to sleep. So, <laughs> so this might be in our favor today. But thank you so much for coming and, and doing this. That was a long trip. So <laughs> you guys are awesome. Isn't that so cute? So see, people, for those of you that support the ministry, this is what it, it doesn't, it's not just here. It literally goes out into the world and people watch and they're just so adorable. I'm just like, that's the cutest thing. Um, okay, I got to show you another really quick video. At this point, people are like, does she ever talk about Bible? I really do, okay? <laughs> um, I have to show you this because my, my one son, um, he has two daughters, and they go to the, the daddy-daughter dance every year. And then my, my nephew, he takes his daughters to the daddy-daughter dance. So Sean is our other son, and so he did this, this video about the daddy-daughter dance. You have to see this. Oh. You look beautiful tonight. Really proud of you. The way you were moving on the dance floor is amazing. Mm. And he knew the whole Macarena. I don't even know what that is. Mm. It's impressive. It's impressive. Mm -hmm. You want some ice cream? Mm. No? All right. All right, take it by your silence. You just want to go home. <laughs> okay, serious? That's my latest granddaughter, okay? I was like, oh, how cute is she? Okay, let's talk Bible. Today we are going to talk about a, um, a short parable, and a lot of people don't even think this might even be a parable, but because they use word pictures, and most of Jesus' parables were all about word pictures, um, we, you know, we've seen it all through the parables on you know, wheat or seeds or feasts or whatever. And so today we're going to talk about two words that Jesus talks about in two really quick little uh, verses today. And we're going to be talking about salt and light, and mostly about light because we're going to run out of time, and I just know that that's just what's going to happen today. So these are two things that would have made total sense in the days of Jesus. Now, the point that we're going to make today, we'll give you the point ahead of time so you'll kind of know what, what we're, where we're going, is the question we want to ask ourselves is this. Are we different? Like, are we different? Are we being light to a very dark world? Are we being salt? Are we producing what I would say, like if you're light, you're producing light. But I, I, I want to take this a, a, another little direction and say, are we producing this sweet aroma that the Apostle Paul talks about? Now, the reason, uh, I'll give you an illustration really quick about about this sweet aroma. Uh, what, every year we go to California, and Rob and I ride bikes, most of you know that, so we ride bikes into the town of Encinitas. And when we get to this one corner, like everything smells like 
baked goods, like, like brownies and cinnamon rolls, and, and we're outside, and everything just smells so good. So one day, I went in, and I got really creepy, and I looked into the window of this place, okay? And I peeked in there, and the, win the windows were open, and it's a bakery. Like, they were baking things for I don't know who. And so I yelled into the window, and I said, <laughs> thanks for making everything out here smell so good, okay? Because it did, that's exactly what it did. It just made the whole area smell so good. And so I realized that with this whole thing about light and salt and a sweet aroma, it's like that's our job. Like if you and I are followers of Jesus, then that's our job to be a, a, a light or this, this good smelling aroma around our family and our friends and our work and our, our neighbors and all of that. And, and, and how that looks is like we're the ones that have peace, and we're the ones that have joy, and we're the ones that aren't fearful of everything, and we're not the ones freaking out about everything. And just like a cinnamon roll, like I really wanted a cinnamon roll when I get to the edge of that corner because of the smell. And it's kind of like that's how it's supposed to be for us as Christians, like people should be able to see us, and we're so different. What's coming off of us is something so completely different than what the world is. So. Uh, we're going to watch a video. For those of you, if you're new today, we went to Israel this summer. We're videotaping certain spots um, in Israel that kind of coincide with the parable. So you can see Israel, but you can also kind of see what Jesus saw. This is a really cool video because you'll see some steps where they're absolutely convinced Jesus walked up. So we'll watch this really quick. Maybe. Good morning. Welcome to Israel as we are continuing our series, Life Changing Stories, The Parables of Jesus. Today we are at some place really awesome, uh, a place called Caiaphas's house. And we wanted to videotape uh, it here, this lesson here, because of something that happened over 2,000 years ago with one of Jesus' very closest friends, Peter. Before Jesus was going to the cross, before he was uh, going to be arrested, he tried to explain to all of his disciples exactly what was going to happen, that he would be arrested, tried, convicted, most likely hung on a cross. But Peter told Jesus, Jesus, I will always stand beside you. I will always stand behind you. And, and, and you know what? I will even die for you if need be, which sounded really super awesome until Jesus was arrested. And Peter began to understand something that we probably need to get, and that is following Jesus could really mean hardship for us. And for Peter, it meant that he could very well be crucified just like Jesus was about ready to be. So it was in this particular place here in the courtyard that Peter, who followed Jesus for three years, did something so shocking, and that was that he denied that he ever even knew Jesus. He denied that he was one of his one of Jesus' followers, which is what we're going to talk about. But we want you to see this place, so a couple things we want to show you on the video. We want to show you what, what Caiaphas' house, what's going on in here. First, we want to show you the steps. Now, the first time that we ever came to Israel, you could actually walk up and down these steps. Uh, but our, they finally just enclosed them because there was so much foot traffic, they didn't want to ruin them because archaeologists are certain that these steps were in use at the time of Christ. Um, on the evening of the arrest of Jesus, he and his disciples most likely came down these steps on their way from the Last Supper, um, from the uh, from the Garden of Get to the Garden of Gethsemane. Uh, we're going to show you a map of the old city, and you can kind of see the placement of where Caiaphas's house is and where the Garden of Gethsemane is. Um, and these would have been the steps that Jesus would have been brought up under guard to the high priest Caiaphas's house, which is where we're standing today. Uh, we also want you to see down below is what is called, it, it's called a prisoner's cell. It's actually called Christ's prison. Uh, when you come to Caiaphas's house, you'll go downstairs and you'll see this. This is most likely where Jesus spent the night before he was crucified. Uh, the only access to this really for Jesus would have been a shaft from above. So Jesus would have been lowered and raised by means of a rope harness. The reason we wanted to videotape this particular place in the courtyard was because of what happened here. Jesus had been taken by guards. Peter followed him. But here's what was so shocking. When asked if Peter was a follower of Jesus, he said, nope. I'm not, and not only once, but he did that three times. You'll see a, a statue here. It depicts this whole scene of where the young girl was like, hey, do you know Jesus? And he's like, no, I don't know him at all. And it kind of shows you what was going on at this time. But instead, when confronted with the fact that he was, are you a follower of Jesus? This is what happened in John 18. 
Verse 12, so the band of soldiers and their captain and the officers of the Jews arrested Jesus and bound him. First they led him to Annas, for he was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. It was Caiaphas who would advise the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die for the people. Simon Peter followed Jesus and so did another disciple. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he entered with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. So here was Peter's chance to be salt, to stand up for his faith, to point other people to Jesus. But here's what we learn. Salt that loses its saltiness is useless. And Peter became pretty much useless that night. Verse 16 says this, but Peter stood outside the door. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the servant girl who watched the door and brought Peter in. The servant girl at the door said to Peter, you also are not one of the man's disciples, are you? Peter said, I am not. Now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was very cold. They were standing and warming themselves. Peter also was with them standing and warming himself. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. So they said to him, you also are not one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the servants of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Peter again denied it, and at once a rooster crowed. Peter had this perfect opportunity to be salt, to point this, this little servant girl, the servant of Annas and Caiaphas, to Jesus, but he didn't. So to close out this video, we're standing here at Caiaphas's house overlooking the Mount of Olives. And I want you to look up at the very, very top of the hill. And up there is a house. And at nighttime, that house will be lit up so everyone in the city would be able to see it. Which brings us to the second part of this very short parable. Verse 14 says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. And that is how anyone claiming to follow Christ, that's what we should look like, a light on a hill. Because light has the ability to banish darkness around us. Light, if it's hidden, it is completely useless. And Jesus is trying to make that really important point in this parable. If we say we're Christians, if we say we're followers of Jesus, our lives should stand out, not in a weird, goofy way, but we should be so different in a good way that people really honestly want what we have. And we can't do what Peter did, which was hide the light because of fear of others. Verse 15 says, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, it gives light to all in the house. And in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who's in heaven. So today in class, we're gonna be talking about what it means to be salt and light. And we see this from a place in Israel, a place where Peter lost his light and lost his saltiness, which is a lesson for all of us that being salt and being light is actually a choice, just like Peter made a choice that night in the courthouse at Caiaphas' house. Okay, Hannah, you have to come back with Lucas. Come on, you're fine. As long as he's not screaming, we're fine. So just, he's adorable, okay? So just so you know that. Um, I, I'd hold him in, up here, if, you know, but he looks like he's gonna fall asleep. See, he'll be asleep in five seconds, okay? All right, let's start with light. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. No one lights a lamp and then puts it under a basket. Instead, a light is placed on a stand where it gives light to everyone in the house. It's like this up here. It's like this room were completely dark. Then we would turn this light on, and, and the light is what everybody would see. And that's kind of the point to what we're talking about today, that we're to be a light to other people around us. But I'm not really certain that that is going on a lot. And I say this because I, 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 I'll tell you a joke that makes, well, you'll understand it when I, when I tell you this. There was a, a group of people and they were at a party one time and they decided they wanted to try to figure out like, like what each person's profession was. So they were all standing and they said, I think that guy's a lawyer. So they walked up to the, the guy and they said, are you a lawyer? And he goes, I am. And so they said, well, I think that guy over there's a doctor. So he goes over and he says, are you a doctor? And he said, I am. And they looked at this one guy and they said, I bet he's a pastor. So they walked up and they said, are you a pastor? And he goes, oh no, I've just been really sick with the flu for the past week. <laughs> but as weird as that is, you'll, some of you will get that later on tonight, okay? So, 
But it's kind of like, we just kind of, people look at us and we look sickly and we just look miserable and we're unhappy and we don't look like light. We kind of look more like darkness than we do a light. And, and sometimes we just act, you know, we're not very joyful, we kind of act like jerks, we stick our nose in the air and judge other people, and, and we're mean, and we're just kind of, we gossip, and we just, we're just not a light. And I think this parable today is a reminder to all of us, including me, that our job is to be different, to be something completely different than everyone else. And, 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 and when we act weird ways like that, people are like, yeah, I don't really want to be like you. Why would I want your Jesus if you're no different than me? The Apostle Paul says this, as light, we're supposed to give off this fragrance. He says in 2 Corinthians 2.15, our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we're a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we're a life-giving perfume. Isn't that amazing? It's like that's what we should, be, we should be producing in our life and then other people should be able to see that. It's just a reminder that if you and I are followers of Jesus, our lives have to look different. Like we can't be like everybody else. So when people look at us, they see us responding to everything so completely different. And that's what's actually the bright light or the sweet aroma or whatever that looks like. So I wanna talk really quick about how that plays out in our life. Like, okay, I'm supposed to be a light, but how do I go about doing that? And here's the first thing. We should be the ones not freaking out. Okay, and, and this is something we gotta get. We live in a world that feels like it's going to hell in a handbasket. Like we always said, like it just feels like that. The elections are coming up again, okay? And just that alone brings on its own like level of stress to whatever. People are terrified, they're nervous. We have things like the coronavirus that just like, I'm telling you, we have a company in China. And we do probably I have thousands and thousands and thousands of designs, dental designs a day. They walked in with a camera and they shut our entire company down a, a couple weeks ago. Now, that in itself just brings on fear. Like, okay, what if all of our techs have, have this virus? What if, what if, what if no one comes back to us because of, I mean, there's just, there's just fear. Anything that happens in our lives just brings on fear. And we, we freak out about things like Social Security and, and the wall and, and the economy. And last year, the past three years, we've seen Donald Trump as president. And honestly, just this country is so divided. Everything's just, there's no disrespect, there's no respect for the president any longer. I don't care who he is. But it, it, we just see this disrespect, and it's just so weird. I found this on, on Facebook. It made me laugh. Um, this is about respect. There was a company boss, he was complaining at his staff meeting that he was getting no respect. He's like, nobody respects me here. So he went out and he bought a little sign and he put it on the door that read, I'm the boss. And he thought, I'm, this is gonna get me respect. So he went to lunch and he came back and somebody taped right over and said, hey, your wife called, she wants her sign back. <laughs> I'm like, yes, so well, there you go, no respect. <laughs> but you know what? We should be the ones that are totally a light to those around us. We should be the ones pointing people to God on our Facebook page, on our Instagram page. I can turn that off because that's kind of bright, isn't it? Kind of bright. We should be the ones that, especially like this election season, like we should be the ones not bashing anyone. But we should be the one lifting God high like this. We should say this. I'm going to remember how to do this. We should put this on our Facebook page. God knows what he's doing. Daniel 2.21, he controls the course of world events. He removes kings, presidents, and sets up other kings, presidents, and he gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to the scholars. See, we should be the ones that have so much peace during this election season, and we should be promoting that to other people. Like, I don't know, aren't you worried about the elections? Not really. Why? Because I know God. And I know this God who raises up presidents and deposes presidents if he doesn't want them. Like, this is a God thing. I wrote this. Do you realize that election season could be the greatest opportunity to be a light in this world and point people to this powerful God who actually can sway the election? Like, what if we just always told people that verse? I don't know. God controls the course of world events. He removes kings and sets up other kings. 
End of story. But imagine if your friends could see that in your life. Like, why aren't you worried? I don't know, God's in control. There's something peaceful about knowing that. And we have to be on board with whoever God puts in office. I, I told you this, I tell you this all the time whenever we have an election, but I saw this girl at a hair salon many, many years ago, and it was before one of the elections, I don't remember which one it was, and she was all, she's younger than me, and so I saw her there, and she has gray hair, and at the time I didn't. And so I said, she looked at me and she goes, um, why do I have gray hair and you don't? And I said, I have no idea. And then she started talking about the elections. And she's like, I'm so nervous, I'm so afraid, I can't sleep at night. I'm like, yep, now I know why you have gray hair, okay? Because <laughs> I don't worry about that stuff. Like, I just don't. I'm like, I don't know. Um, God's gonna do what he needs to do. And the reason we know that is because we study books like Revelation. And we see what, what's come, like we see how it's all gonna end, which is why you need to be at Joel next week because it, he's gonna tell us what countries should we be looking out for? What, what do we look for in the Antichrist? Like what, what, is, what do we need to be prepared for? Like those are important things. But we know that this world is on a one-way track to the end. And it just is. And how does God always do things by foreign countries and world leaders and presidents? And he's, they're all just, it's like a chess board. And he's just putting who he needs in. And so we're just going to be sit back and say, God, you're doing what you need to do. We pray, we vote, and then we let God do the rest. Because this is God's deal. Wait, memorize this verse, because it's kind of awesome. It's like God says this, Why do the nations conspire and the people plot in vain? I, I thought about that with the whole impeachment thing. I don't care how you feel about impeachment, not impeachment. I don't care. If the president's supposed to be impeached, God's going to make that happen. If he's not, he's going to make sure it doesn't. But, but people are conspiring, and God's like, yeah, you're doing all that in vain. Like, I'm in control. And when we get that, we can be okay with it. The kings of the earth take their stand, and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed. But look what God does. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. Like, imagine that. God is up there laughing at everything he's seeing going on on this earth right now politically. He's like, oh, that's so cute. That's so funny. You guys have no idea, and you can't control anything. It's like a child when they're trying to drive. Like, that would be like giving cute little Lucas, like, a car right now. And you'd be like, I'm sorry. You're just not, you're not, you can't do it. I, I found these. I thought these were cute. Yeah, this is why we don't, <laughs> this is why we don't give kids cars. How's this one? Okay, this is funny. <laughs> is that the cutest thing? Oh, poor little guy. Um, okay, I'll, I, I don't know how to stop it. Okay, but here's the deal. He's saying, that's like God. It's like when you're a parent and you have a child like that, you're like, I'm sorry, you can't drive a car. You're just too little. And God is like, I'm sorry, but you, you don't understand that I'm big and I, that we got a big picture here. So our job is to do this, knowing God so well that we trust him for whatever is happening. Like that's, what, that's the goal in, in our life. And the goal is to get to know him this way and to be able to say, how awesome is the Lord most high, the great king over all the earth. Like, do you ever think like, oh, God is really king over this earth? Like, I don't know that we really think that way, but when you get to that point, it changes your whole view on everything, politics and, and things that go on in, in this world. How about this one? Psalm 47, 8, God reigns over the nations. God sits upon his holy throne. Do you know he actually does that? He reigns over the nations, and, you know, we're a nation, so there you go. But if you don't have a high view of God, you're not going to feel that way, and you're going to be panic-stricken and all of those things. But being a light in this dark world means this. We don't think like everyone else. We really don't. And so we need to understand that going into this, that I give my life to Christ and I don't think like everyone else. I think like God is powerful and he's awesome and he's ruler. And when you start thinking like that, you just stop freaking out about things. And I'm not just talking about politics. I'm talking about anything. Like, it was so cute. Juan came in this morning, and he was talking about, because um, most of you knew Juan had a heart attack a, a couple months ago. So they got, have him on these blood thinners. Well, apparently, his blood thinner ran out last night, but he had to get more pills, but his doctor had to, and all this was going on, he didn't know what to do. So they tried to call the pharmacy. They said no. So Juan went down to the pharmacist, and he tried to explain the situation. The pharmacist is like, I'm sorry, I can't do that for you. Now, Juan has choice. He's either going to be a light or he's going to be dark. And if you're going to be a light, you're going to be nice and kind and you're not going to freak out and be angry and scream and yell. And so he goes, hey man, 
it's no problem. He goes, the cool part about this, he goes, first of all, if I die tonight, it'll be your fault. <laughs> and, he, and he was a joke, and, and the guy laughed, and he said, but more than that, if I die tonight, I go meet Jesus. And he goes, so I win. And the, the pharmacist looked at me, he goes, are you a Christian? And he goes, I am. And he goes, hang on one second. He brings him two pills. He says, here you go. You know, but it was so cool because of Juan's response. And that's what I'm saying. Our response on things like, um, I got bad news from the doctor. I, I, you know, someone was just talking to me this morning and she just found some bad news of, you know, she has tumors and the stuff. And, and she goes, but the good part is that the good news is it's not cancerous. And I said, you know what? As weird as this sounds, even if it were cancerous, it would still be okay. I can, and that's hard for people to understand, but it's the truth. It's like, you know what, God, whatever, you just wake up and go, God, whatever you have for me. I just want to be a light in a dark world, but sometimes that means in a doctor's office, okay? And I don't, I, I just, that's just kind of the way it is. It's kind of like some of you get a bill in the mail and you're all freaked out, this isn't right, and you're screaming and yelling and your neighbors are like, what's different about you? It's kind of like you get the pink slip at work and, you, and you know, you're all upset about, you know, I've lost my job. And those are the times that God's saying, I just want you to be peaceful and joyful and so that these people can see that you're different. And the reason we can put a smile on our face is because of this. God is our refuge and strength. He's always ready to help in times of trouble. So, so we will not fear when, what? Earthquakes. Mountains crumble into the sea. When you lose your job, when you get a bad doctor's report, like, we're, we're not going to fear. I love the next verse. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble. Like, bring it on. Because you know what? I just know God is in control, and I'm just not going to worry about any of it. And because here's why. People are watching, and they are fearful of anything that I just talked about. We had one of our kids that were moving into a, a new house, and he got this big payment, down payment bill that he wasn't expecting. He calls me totally freaking out. And he's like, mom, I'm so stressed. And so he goes to the whole wife, what if I can't do this? And what if I can't afford this? And what if, what if, what if? And I said, stop. I said, God is trying to teach you one thing. You might as well learn this when you're young because it's, all the stress is going to happen with children and marriage. It's just life, okay? But I said, stop freaking out because you need to get to the point of saying, all right, God, I got this bill, I wasn't expecting it. I don't know what to do with this, but you know what? I'm gonna, you're my refuge and my strength. I'm gonna trust you with this. See how that just changes the whole thing? And then people look at you and they're like, why aren't you upset or worried? And you're like, why would I be? I know the God of the universe, he lives in me. It's kind of cool. Here's a joke about a blonde who was freaking out. <laughs> For all you blondes out there. <laughs> An airline captain. He was uh, helping a new blonde flight attendant. As, you know, she was getting ready for her first overnight trip. And they get there at the hotel, and he's showing her around, and he's saying, you know, this is the restaurant, and blah, blah, blah. The next morning, the pilot's preparing the crew for the day's, you know, route, and he noticed that the new flight attendant wasn't there, and he was like, where is she? So he called her room, and she's crying and sobbing, and she goes, I can't get out of my room. And he's like, why would you not be able to get out of your room? And she goes, there's only three doors. One is the bathroom, and one is the closet, and one has a sign that says, do not disturb. <laughs> I know. I can only say that because I'm sort of blonde, okay? <laughs> but I was thinking about this whole thing about God is our refuge and he's all this and, and we, we trust him. And I thought about this, this this Christmas. So we got all of our journals, our Bible reading plan journals in and they came in in I think late November. Well, everyone wants them for Christmas. So what I would have to do is put the orders together and then, then bundle them all up and then take them to the post office and stand in the Christmas line. So for those of you that got yours, you're very welcome. Um, but, but here's the thing is, is that I would go to the post office every day with like all these packages in my arms and then I would drop them off at of the post office and walk out and I would be like, oh my gosh, I'm free. Like I feel so free because I did my part. I did what I was supposed to do, like put them together, get them to the post office. But now there was this sense of, I don't have to worry about that anymore because the post office got it. And that's exactly what it's like for us when we have issues in our life. We're just like, I'm going to do the best I can to make my marriage work. I'm going to do the best I can to get that job. I'm going to do the best I can to study for that test. But ultimately, once I do the best I can do, then the rest is totally up to God and we can sit back and relax. And that's the cool part about knowing him. 
And when your friends see this calm on your face and this joy on your face that you're just not freaking out about anything, it changes everything. Many years ago, some prospectors in California, they were up and they found this really, really rich vein of gold. And they were so excited because they knew they would be wealthy beyond their imagination for the rest of their life. But they had to go into town to get some supplies. So they got together and they said, look, we're going to go in, get supplies. You don't talk to anyone. You don't tell them anything. Like, n no one can know that we just found this whole vein of gold. And so they said, fine, they made a pact. So they went and they got all their supplies. But when they left, half of the town followed them. And this is why. They were not able to hide what was in their hearts because it showed on their faces. Their faces just showed excitement. And so people were like, I don't know, they must have found something. Look at their faces. And I thought, that's what needs to happen with us as followers of Jesus. Like, we should be the ones that are smiling and happy. And people are like, why are you smiling? It's like, I don't know. Life's good because God's good. Like, I don't know. We just have to change our thought process on that because we want to be a light so others will want what we have. I was, the other day, this is going to sound weird. It's going to sound weird to people like Cheyenne or, or, or Meredith or Hannah because they're just younger. And, and I think when you get older, you're, you know, if you've grown in your faith, then you don't think like probably they, because they've got babies and kids and marriage and all that stuff. So, so I'm going to sound cynical here, but someone the other day was talking about people who color their hair. And they said, ah, you shouldn't color your hair. The cancer risk is so high. My response is this. Well, I'm coloring my hair. And if I get cancer and I die, well, then I get to go spend eternity in heaven where there's no cancer or no death. So I think I win on that deal, okay? <laughs> but it's like, I, I don't know that I felt that way when I was 20 or 30. But I feel that way now. And I think it's because I, I've grown to know God. And I've grown to see this big picture of eternity. And, and so things of the world just aren't that impressive to me any longer. And, and it's going to sound, like I said, cynical. But hopefully it, it's not. But I, I even came to the, this, and I, this is, I, most of you know this is the name of our next book. It doesn't really matter. And I think if we can actually, we can smile. Because when things happen, we can go, I don't know, it doesn't really matter. It's like in light of eternity, the bills you're worried about today, you won't even remember them next year. That's just the way it happens. It's like, I don't remember what I was worried about last year. The bankruptcy you're facing right now, a year from now, it's not going to matter. Because you're either going to be bankrupt or God's going to save it or I don't know. Either way, it doesn't really matter. The job loss you're facing now, same thing. It's not going to matter a year from now. Because God's either going to get you a new job or he's going to show you how he can provide for you while you don't have a job. The sickness you're now facing, I, I don't know. My sweet, sweet aunt. I just saw her about, I don't know, six or seven weeks ago at my mom's birthday. And just, she was, was having a hard time walking, and, and they didn't know what was wrong. She went to the chiropractor, and she's got like ovarian cancer. It, totally out, that, just had no idea this was coming. And, and, and I go, okay, you know what? Whatever, it's either going to, you know, she's either going to do chemo and get better, or she's not. And then she'll get to go spend eternity with Jesus. I don't know. Like, I think if we just start thinking through the things that we're freaking out about, we go, I don't really need to freak out about that anymore. God will take care of it one way or the other, and however he does, it's fine. And I think once you get to that point, it makes life so much simpler. Some of you have marriages that are just not that good. You're not married to Christian men, and, and some of you are married to Christian men, and it's really difficult. So th that doesn't really seem to matter much. But here's the bottom line is if you've been married for 50 years, I don't know, maybe you got another 10 20. I, I don't know. And then it's over. And then you get to go spend eternity with Jesus. So I think it's kind of like, you just go, well, does it really matter? I'm just going to be here and be joyful and loving. And I'm going to be a light. And I'm going to do what I can with what God has given me. And I think if you get that point, this is what I say. The more we know Jesus, the less we freak out. And that's why we do Bible study. It's like, we want you to know Jesus so you don't have to freak out. One pastor put it like this. He says, think of this. It's like a runway for models. Models who are on this kind of runway, they walk down, they, 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 they're walking in front of a crowd, in front of the media, in front of potential buyers, and, and they're representing a specific fashion house. 
And the type of modeling here isn't about the model. Like, the models are doing everything they can to be low key. They don't want to distract from their main objective, which is to sell their clothes because they work for this fashion house. The Bible tells us that's kind of what he does with us. He's, he's, he's actually putting us on a runway through this earth, okay, at your jobs, at your homes, at your workplace, with your friends or whatever. And he's not using us to, you know, to show people our clothes and our purses and all those things. But he's doing this. Thanks be to God who in Christ Jesus leads us in triumphal procession. Through us, he spreads the fragrance of knowledge of him everywhere. Like, we're, think about that. Well, you go places and you're a model. You're a model and you're, a model and you're, you're modeling the fragrance and the knowledge of God. Like, that's kind of a really cool thing. He's not showing our you know, purses and clothes. He's showing the world his people. And his people should be different. And see, we're the product that he wants to walk down our runway. And he does that because he wants the world to see what he has done in our lives and what he's offering to others. But if our lives don't look different than everyone else's, then no one's going to want him. And then eternity is at stake for these people. So the stakes are pretty high. Second thing is this. We should act different. We literally should act different. Greg Trimble wrote this. He said, if you're going to be a Christian, then you better act like it. It doesn't sound too difficult, but it, that's kind of what it, it means. He's saying, don't treat people like dirt and then expect them to come to Bible study or church with you. He said, if you're going to drive around in your really cool truck and giving the middle finger to every person that you know, that's, doesn't drive fast enough, but yet your back window has a not of this world sticker, or a church sticker, or a Jesus, <laughs> or whoever sticker. It's like, don't, don't do that. It's not doing any good. If you have a cross hanging from your rear view mirror, and you're just like, you know, flashing your lights and yelling obscenities when someone passes, it's like, ah, dad, don't do that. Like, it's like, we really have to be different. Greg Trimble was telling a story about these, the, um, these co-workers um, that this work. So I'm going to tell you who these guys are up here. I'm going to show you what's going on. These two guys are Jason and Mike right here. And, and Jason and Mike, they own their own business. And Bob, J Jason and Mike would say they're Christians, okay? They do everything to like that Christians do at work. They bring their Bible, they put verses on their desk, and then they put, you know, the picture of the eagle, and we run like an eagle, and blah, blah, blah. You know, but that's just what people do. So, uh, Jason and Mike over here, that's just kind of what they do. And so everyone assumes that they're Christians. But here's Bob. Sweet little Bob. Bob's not a Christian. Okay, so Bob doesn't know anything, but Jason and Mike keep inviting him to church. But the problem is, is that Bob doesn't want to go to church. So he told his friend one day why. He said, why would I want to go when they treat people so bad at work? It's like this. Jason, Jason. What? I, 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 my, my son is really sick and I need to go pick him up at school. What? You can't pick him up at school? No. I'm never going to get back on that thing, am I? You're never, you can't pick him up. <laughs> you can't pick your son up. You're working for me. You get someone to take care of him. Okay, you get that. Hey, you want to come to church? He's like, no, I don't want to come to church. Okay, so then this guy comes up and he's like, hey, hey, Jason, I, um, I, I didn't get that, that job, that account you wanted me to get. What? You didn't get, I'm going to fire you. You're such a jerk. Hey, do you want to come to church with me this week? Okay, you get the picture? Although he's, not, he's kind of sad right now, I guess. <laughs> but see, this is what goes on. It's like we act one way because we're trying to tell people about Jesus and people behind are like, what is wrong with you? You're acting like nobody different than anybody else in the world. Like, we're the ones supposed to be compassionate. They should have turned around and said, absolutely, what can we do for you? No problem, you didn't get that account. Like, you know what, things like that happen. But if we're screaming and yelling and we're doing everything other than what Jesus says, then, ah, here's the deal. If we're gonna be a Christian, then we need to start representing Jesus well. Like, that's just kind of what needs to happen. I, I wrote this down, and some of you are going to hate me for this, but you'll, you'll be okay. When you stop screaming and yelling and being mean to people, 
I, I'm sorry, I don't even know how to say that any nicer. Like, because people, we scream at our husbands and we scream at our kids and we yell at our this and then we yell at the person in the line. We just do that and I'm just saying, can we just stop? We have got to be a light to people. Could we stop? And I'm saying that I won't even say you any longer, I'll say me. Can we, me, stop moping around? My life is miserable. Not very happy today. Really? I don't know. We have Jesus in our life and we're going to heaven. I think we could be happy no matter what's happening. We have got to stop giving people attitudes like, "Ah, ah, ah, ah." stop it, okay? (laughs) It's ridiculous. And then how's this? We complain about every little thing that's going on in our life bad. Could we maybe not do that? Could we maybe be like, oh yeah, you know what? I have a bunion on my foot. Do we get bunions on our feet or toe or whatever? But it's okay, you know? Uh, it's, it's fine. We're, we're good to go. I loved it. I was at, I was at um, lunch with Jeanette the other day and she, she broke her toe and it was kind of sad. And she was wearing like, I wear flip-flops everywhere. Like this is the most you'll ever see me dressed up. It was so cute. I'll go back to Jeanette in a second. So one of the ladies that comes here, her son lives out by us in New River. And so she said, someday I'm going to come visit you. And so Saturday, okay, Saturday at 10 o'clock, okay, I have no makeup on. Okay, I do not look like this. I'm in my pajamas, okay? And she came and showed up the door, and I was like, oh, hi, welcome. I know I don't look like this normally, but... um, I don't know why I told you that. There was no reason for that. Uh, So Jeanette, anyway, the the shoes... Oh, I was telling you because of flip-flops. When I, I wear this when I'm here, but then normally I just wear flip-flops. But I was like, um, I was like, oh, that's so sad. Like she, she broke her toe, and but she was so nice about it. She just never complains about anything, and she just, she just doesn't. But some people are just like, my toe's broke. I'm gonna die. I mean, this is kind of what we do. So, here's what you need to know. Jeez, people are watching you. Okay, <laughs> that's my whole point. We need to be reminded of this. We really do. We need to be reminded to let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who's in heaven. That's just kind of the goal of being a Christian, but somehow we keep forgetting that. Okay, um, we cannot do one of these studies without our Skit Guys video. Okay, ready? This is all on, on being a light shining. All right, that takes care of the back of the house. You want to... You want to go around and take the lights off the front? Yeah, that'd be great. Oh, hey, by the way, thank you. If it wasn't for you, I don't know who'd get on that roof. You are awesome. Yeah. He's, uh, is that the house you were talking about? Oh, yeah, yeah. They leave their lights up all year round. They leave their lights on all year long. Here, check it out. So they leave their lights on all year long? All year long. And those bulbs change according to whatever holiday season it is. Get out. Can't wish I could. So like July 4th? Those bulbs come red, white, and blue. Thanksgiving. Harvest colors. Halloween. Black and orange. Memorial Day. Camouflage. Get out! Can't wish I could. I bet it's embarrassing for the neighbors. Oh, the neighbors. We're totally embarrassed. We complain about it all the time. Oh, and when there is no holiday season going on, those bulbs become little red hot chili pepper lights. What? Yep. Give me one good reason why you should celebrate the pepper. (sighs) Can't wish I could. It's like your neighbors are the Motel 6. And my wife, she's always saying, let's just leave the lights on just a little bit longer, let you stay in the spirit of things. But when Christmas is over, you take down the lights, am I right? I don't know. I'm not even the right guy to ask. I don't even put lights on my house. Why don't you put lights on your house? I'm afraid of heights. But the question is, why do you put lights on your house? To celebrate Christmas, the birth of Christ, all that kind of stuff. There you go, that's your answer. What? If you don't want to celebrate Christ all year long, then take the lights down. That's not what I was saying. You're putting words in my mouth. You're siding with my wife. Hey, hey, I'm not siding with anyone. I'm, and I'm sorry. I didn't realize that you and God were, uh, you know... On the outs? Yeah. We're not on the outs. Me and God, we're very tight. We're very, very tight. Really? Yes. Really? Yes. Prove it. Prove what? Are you daring me to leave my lights on all year long? Hey, no dare here. I'm just saying... You gonna let your little light shine? Wait! Man the ladder, my friend. What? Man that ladder. We're gonna get back up there and hang these lights. No, no, no. Oh, I was just kidding. Oh, yes. It is gonna be a proclamation of my faith. Didn't you hear? I- I'm afraid of heights. You're already up there. 
<laughs> honey, honey, get the apple cider ready. Put on the Perry Como records. These lights are gonna shine. <laughs> get back here. These lights have to shine. Seriously, how cute are they? Like a little, but that's a, but what a great point. Like well, I don't know if you're putting your lights up for Christmas. Like yeah, that makes that makes total sense. All right, here's the bottom line. Here the Bible says this: if we're not doing that, we're not living this whole like I'm a light kind of a thing. A lot of times, what we do because we're supposed to live, you know, be spirit filled, and then that joy and love and peace and all those things come out of us. But a lot of times, we live in the flesh. Cheyenne made me laugh the other day. She had to call somebody, and she was really annoyed about something. And so her, her words out of her mouth to this person was, I just want you to know that what I'm about ready to say is totally out of my flesh, okay? And because sometimes we do that, and we all do that. We all have fleshly moments, but they should not be fleshly like this is how I live my life. So unfortunately, what happens over here with, with, with Jason and Mike and Bob is that his, he, I really can't get him to stand up. He's a bad puppet. Um, but as we saw here, Jason and Mike were living in the flesh. And when you're living in the flesh, what happens is non-Christians see that, and they're just like, yeah, I'm sorry. But Bob was, in essence, saying this to them, and we say this all the time. Your actions are speaking so loud, I can't hear your words. I, I want to put that up every single week as a reminder to us. But we're going to look at a list really quick. And, and in your handouts, you actually have definitions of every single one of these words, which we do not have time to go over. So I'm just going to throw some of these up here really quick. Galatians 5.19, when you follow the desires of your sinful nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures. We all know that if you're having an affair, you're sleeping around, you're doing stupid stuff sexually, watching porn, whatever, you're living in the flesh. And God says, I'm sorry, the light is dark. There's no, there's no light in that. Um, the next one here is, um, let's see, we saw that. Uh, impurity, it tells you all those, sorry. Um, next ones are idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division. Um, I thought this was cute. There was a, the one you were talking about, the sorcery. The word for sorcery is, actually comes from a, a word that stems to our pharmacy, so it's a lot of drug addiction, stuff like that. I thought this was cute. I think I told this to you before. A little old lady was amazed at how nice her young man, her friend, her young little neighbor was next door. He was like 16. Um, she, every day he'd help her. And she finally said one day, how did you become such a fine young boy? And he said, well, when I was a little boy, I had a drug problem. And she's like, there's no way you had a drug problem. Like, you're the nicest kid in the world. And he says, well, it's true. My parents drug me to church on Sunday morning, <laughs> drug me to church on Sunday night, and drug me to church on Wednesday nights. OK, so there you go. But I do want to talk about some of these words here because, you know, a lot of us aren't having affairs and watching porn and doing stuff like that. But there's a lot of stuff up here that we're doing. Um, let me get to the right thing. I think this was it. Paul lists a group of relationship sins, all of which we translate neatly from Greek into English. Enmity is hating certain people groups. Do you, like, hate certain groups of people. Like, th th this is something you're going to need to talk about within yourself. Strife refers to the stirring up of discord and division. Would you believe the churches and Bible studies have tons of that going on? And I want none of that in here. Just so you know, if you have strife with the girl at the other table, you need to go make it right. Because bi the Bible says you are living in the flesh. You're not living in the spirit. You're not being a light. Um, jealousy, of course, self-explanatory. Uh, fits of anger, uh, you, can, you can see that we've, we, a lot of people do that. Dissensions, where you break unity without good cause. Divisions means unjustly or unfairly taking sides. You kind of see that, that there's just a lot of things that we need to not do. And then the next one is envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. So um, I, I'm going to tell you my funny joke. I always, I, I've told you this before, but it actually does fit here. It's my nun goes to Hooters joke, okay? But it'll, if you've never heard it, it'll make sense in a second. So a nun needed to go to the bathroom. She walked into a local Hooters. Was, of course, people were drinking. The reason why I'm saying it is because of that. They're drunk, wild parties, what goes on, whatever. But she noticed as she walked in that every so often the lights would just go out 
and then they would come back on. She didn't think anything about it. She goes up to the bartender and she said, hey, I need to use the restroom. And he says, I don't think you should. He goes, well, why not? She says, well, there's a statue of a naked man in there. And his private parts are covered like with a fig leaf. And she goes, well, that's nonsense. I'll just look the other way. It's no big deal. So the bartender showed her the bathroom, and so she went in there. And as soon as she came out of the bathroom, everyone in the whole bar stopped, started clapping for her and applauding. And she goes, sir, I don't understand why they would applaud for me because I just walked out of the bathroom. And he says, well, they now know you're one of us. Okay, that's kind of a key there. You're one of us. She goes, well, still, I don't understand. He goes, well, you see, every time someone lifts the fig leaf on the statue, all the lights go out in the whole place. <laughs> <laughs> now, do you want that drink, he says. <laughs> but here's my point. When you see a nun, you kind of expect her to act a specific way, okay? When people see us as followers of Jesus, it's the same thing. Okay, we're supposed to look different. We're supposed to be a light to the world. And it's something just like Bob could never see with these two up here. Um, Oh, sorry, this, we, see, this is why I knew we were, okay. How we act should represent Jesus, and because of how we act, people should want to come to him. Now, here's what you need to know. It doesn't mean we're always going to be perfect. I'm not perfect. That list, I can give you my own personal list that goes along with that. But my point is this. We stop and we say, God, I shouldn't have acted like that. I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. God, would you change me? See, there's this heart of repentance that goes along with people who are truly followers of Christ. And, and there's, there's not a lot of, if you're up there and you're like, I can drink when I want, and I can be dis divisive whenever I want, no one can tell me what to do, well, you might not be a Christian. I'm sorry to say that, but that's just the truth of it. Because the Bible says that you change, that God changes you, he gives you a heart, and you have this heart to do what he wants you to do. So how does that look? Here's the deal. Uh, we have to do something. I love this story. John Marks, he's a producer for television 60 Minutes. He went on a two-year quest to investigate evangelicals, the group he'd grown up with, but then he walked away from his faith many, many years before. He wrote a book, he called it Reasons to Believe, One Man's Journey Among the Evangelicals and the Faith He Left Behind. He said what changed his whole entire life and, and where he came back to his faith was the church's response to Hurricane Katrina. He said one Baptist church in Baton Rouge fed 16,000 people a day for weeks. Another housed 700 homeless evacuees. Years after the whole, you know, the federal money dried up, churches are still going in there and they're still actually helping. And one worker said this, they crossed all barriers. There's whites, blacks, Hispanics, Vietnamese, and he said good old Cajun. They just said, let's help people. Let's just make some rice. Mark concludes this. He says this. I would argue that this was a watershed moment in the history of American Christianity. Nothing spoke more eloquently to believers and to non-believers who were paying attention that the success of a population of believing volunteers measured against the massive and near total collapse of secular government efforts. The storm laid bare an unmistakable truth. More and more Christians have decided that the only way to reconquer America is through service. The faith no longer travels by the word, it moves by the deed. Isn't that amazing? We can talk and talk and talk, but when we do something to step out and help someone, that's what gets people's heart. That's the power of example. One Christian nurse in a hospital, one Christian teacher in a school, one Christian in a shop or in a factory or an office. See how that works? It's this whole idea, this is what he said, Christians are marked people the world is watching. Matthew 5.16 says this, they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. We gotta act and then do things and help people. There's an episode of a classic 1960s show that of course Cheyenne, Hannah, and Meredith will have no idea what I'm talking about, but some of you might remember the Andy Griffith show, okay? Andy Taylor was the sheriff of Mayberry, okay, that should give you a little clue as to like, it was a little down, okay? Um, Deputy Barney Fife was in charge because, of course, Andy Taylor was out of town. So he deputized his local mechanic, Gomer Pyle. Remember Gomer? Yep. Okay. So Gomer Pyle and Barney Fife are walking down the street and someone's robbing the bank. And they hide behind a car. And Gomer looks at Barney and goes, 
what's the word? Shazam, that's what he always says. We need to call the police. And Barney looks at him and says, we are the police, okay? <laughs> but it's that whole thing of we look around and we go, well, the Christians should be doing something. It's like, wait a minute, we are the Christians. We should be doing something. Okay, and, and everyone needs to be involved in doing something to help someone to be a light so that people will come to Jesus. Now, we only have a few minutes left, so I'm gonna do this really fast. Uh, the last thing is this, you're the salt of the earth. Salt has lost its taste. How shall it be salty and how, how shall the saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown and trampled under people's feet. Salt does a few things. It adds flavor and it, here you go, preserves. It just preserves things. Um, Dennis Kinlaw was a, a professor and he, he lived through the depression. And he said what would happen is his dad would go hunting. They didn't have any money. So he would bring the meat home. And then what would happen is he would have to go in and he would have to salt the meat and then put it in like the, the little storehouse where they kept it. So one day they were doing some dinner for someone and they said, Dennis, go out and get the pork. He went out there, came back, plopped it on the counter. He said he walked out, his mom screams. He comes back and looks at it. And he said, I never saw meat move before, but he said, I realized that it was filled with maggots. And his mom said this, you just did not salt it enough. And it reminded me of this. This is a disgusting piece of meat. We'll get that right off the bat. But it's like this. You have this piece of meat, and this is kind of like, here you go, you're salting it. Okay, salt, 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 okay. The problem is, half of it's salted, the other half isn't. If we're not fully devoting our lives to Jesus and then preserve, you know, preserving this and, and, and loving people, doing what God's calling us to do, have, we want a little world, and we want a little Jesus. And what happens is maggots start arising over here. And then what people see is they see a little God, but a lot of nothing that has anything to do with God. And, and, and that's what, ugh, that's disgusting, okay? Next time I need to think twice about that. But that's the whole point. It's like when we live half of our lives following Jesus and the other half living like everyone else, like we talk like everyone else, we gossip like everyone else, we party like everyone else, we have sex outside of marriage like everyone else, we get angry like everyone else. When we go along with the culture, when we go along with the media, when we go along with the crowd, we're not being very preservative, are we? We're just kind of going along. And what happens is we look like everyone else. We need to ask ourselves this. Am I affecting this world for Jesus or am I being infected by the world and nobody sees Jesus? And every one of us has to come to that point and ask ourselves. Because here's what Jesus did not say. He didn't say, hey, do you want to be my follower? And if you do, you know what? Maybe you could be a little bit of light. Maybe you could be a little bit of salt. Just, just, just a thought. He doesn't say that. Look what he says. You are the salt of the earth, and you are the light of the world. It is our job, wherever he has given us, the place he's gave us influence, wherever you live in Ohio or whether you live in Phoenix, Arizona, you are the salt. You are the light. If you follow Jesus, that's what you have to do, and that's what I have to do. I'll end here. A little toddler was giving her daddy a tea party. He would give her a little cup. He would give him a cup of water, and he thought that was the cutest thing until the wife came home. She, he said, no, 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 watch this. It's the cutest thing. So she goes down the hall. She gets her water, brings it back, and, and, and he drinks it. It's, it's, like, so cute. And the mom just looks at him and says, are you joking? She says, do you not know that the only place she can reach water is the toilet, okay? Okay. <laughs> Here's the bottom line, is that we need to live our lives not like toilet water, okay? But we wanna live our lives with clean, fresh water so that when people look at us, they see a light. And when they see a light, then they're gonna want what we have. And then they're gonna want Jesus. And then you tell them they come to Christ and they get to spend eternity in heaven. And it's kind of a win-win. But if we're not living a life that, has a, that we're like a light, no one's gonna want Jesus. We want them to want what we have. Father, thank you so much for your word. God, I pray that today we will walk out of here and think before we say something or do something or act a certain way, knowing, God, you are, you are the one that we have to represent well on this earth. And I pray, God, for each one of us that you will help us to do that so that other people will see us acting different, living different, so people will come to know you. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.